thank you for watching this special presentation of CBC Saskatchewan News. I'm Christy Kleinman-Haga. Climate change is affecting all Canadians, but in the north, those effects are amplified. We take you to the small community of Fort Chippewan in northern Alberta. Its landscape has been altered by industry and climate change, but the community is adapting, including an annual camp studying the fish in the Peace Athabasca Delta. I think it's time we stopped and start thinking about things. And not for us. When we're gone, this world's still going to be here, but our children are going to be here. And they're the ones that are going to suffer the ill effects of our actions. You know, it may be too late already, but I mean, at least we should try. Yeah. Robert Grandjam navigates the waters of the Peace Athabasca Delta easily. So the darker the water, the, the more reflection of the sun, the warmer the water is. These are his highways. He grew up hunting and fishing here, and he's seen how the land has changed. Yeah, the last couple of years, I noticed the wind is getting really, really strong, and uh, more often. It, it never used to be like that. Today, he's heading to Jackfish, about 90 minutes south of Fort Chippewan, for the annual fish camp. Really rough out there. Good morning. Come back. No. Huh? Blister. No. We have the scientists here. <laughs> so fat content is... Uh, uh, some, too. We have the land users here. I just cut the fillet off. I don't bother the stomach. Yeah. We needed to sample 100 <laughs> from all the other locations. And they're going to work together to, to assess the overall health of the fish. I was like, look all the steps I'm getting in. <laughs> Lori Cyprian is one of the organizers behind this year's event. The people of, of the communities, they've been seeing this forever, right? <laughs> So the scientists are starting to see it as well now. So we're trying to talk their language. We've also been sampling for hydrocarbons in the fish themselves. And so the Data analyst Caroline Bamfield is one of the scientists working with the community. She gathers samples to send back to the lab. We're looking at the shape and size of the fish and if they have enough fat and, and if they are producing enough eggs. We look at the livers to see how big they are and how much energy they're putting into the livers and that gives us a sense as to whether the fish are stressed or whether they're um, subject to toxins in the environment. I wonder what my dad would have said about this process. While the camp is focused on fish, changes to the delta are top of mind. Thank you, sir. We have the hard truth data right here. It's not a fishing story anymore. <laughs> Climate change is just one small part uh, of the bigger picture as well, right? So we have industry upstream, we have Bennett Dams. Climate change just adds to all of those effects uh, that we've been seeing for years. The water levels are dropping significantly earlier than they're supposed to be dropping. People can't access, you know, their traditional areas uh, like they used to. Complicating matters, the seasonal flooding that recharges these waterways is becoming less reliable. You know, they say a delta of changes. You know, we know that. But not at the rate that it's happening. Pickerel, no beer batter. Alice Rigney was born in Fort Chippewan and spent much of her childhood at the Jackfish Camp. When you start thinking about all the other lakes in the delta, you know, where my dad used to go hunt, you know, and yeah, you can't get to them. One lake here we call Egg Lake. A couple years ago, I uh, went there with my brothers, and in runners, I was able to walk pretty well across the lake, where it used to be eight feet of water. Doesn't take long. Look at how easy she makes it. How's it, Kayla? She's really good, thank you. My question is, I'm not concerned about me 50 years from now. I'm not gonna be here. But I have a nine-year-old grandson. What is it going to look like for him? I got to go get more fish. Are you keeping it? Yeah. Maybe Alice or something. Buddy will want it. Morgan Voyager checks the camp's fishing nets. There's two set east of here. He worries what will be left for his children. I did it for practice all my life. And my son here too has been doing it all his life. He's the one that actually went and set all these nets. This one here is the northern pike, the drill. He works with the community tracking change in the water. He's seen levels drop and temperatures rise. It has a drastic effect on the dissolved oxygen in the water. So with no oxygen, 
for fish can't breathe, so they, they either die off or they move on. When there's no more water, we'll have to adapt, which will be sad. I don't think I'll ever see that in my lifetime. Never know. How do you adapt as someone who is so close to the land every day and make a living off of the land? I think with the changing environment, we as human beings, we have to start adapting. We should have started long ago, but we didn't want to. We could, we could manipulate the land to change it so that it's better for us, such as if the river gets low, well then you put a dam in. Well, we have to stop doing that. We, we see the impacts of our activities of manipulating the land now. Elders and community members alike say they expect more changes to come, but they hope that events like the Jackfish Camp will continue to build bridges between scientific and Indigenous communities, better preparing both for the future impacts of climate change. When we talk about climate change, we often hear about mitigation or reducing emissions. But the other piece of the puzzle is adapting to a changing climate. So what is adaptation and what does it look like? Let's see if we can break it down in about a minute. Adaptation refers to how communities prepare and deal with climate change. Planners usually divide adaptation into two categories, hard and soft measures. Hard measures are things like seawalls, levees and drainage channels, often more structural designs to make our cities safer. Soft adaptations are things like emergency management management planning, land use regulations, and even insurance coverage. Now, both hard and soft measures are important when trying to make a community more resilient to the effects of climate change, but finding the balance depends on where you are across Canada, the type of community, be it small or large, rural or urban, and whether it's on the coast or further inland. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Adaptation also needs to account for the social structure of a community. How will vulnerable populations be factored in? So how do planners make these recommendations? They have to look back and learn from past extreme events. And as we head into uncharted waters with climate change, being able to plan for the future is getting more and more difficult. Welcome back. A drive through the Canadian Rockies will treat you to views of Blue Mountain Lakes, wildlife and glaciers. Those towers of ice are crucial for our rivers, but with our changing climate and warming winters, glaciers are receding at an astounding rate. To see firsthand what is happening, I hiked up the Athabasca Glacier to learn how long the massive ice sheets have left and what that means for our water future. Canada's glaciers have long been a symbol of our Rocky Mountain wilderness, but they're disappearing fast. Our glaciers are receding at an alarming rate, not only across Canada, but around the world. In the last 15 years or so, spending more time on the Athabasca Glacier specifically, it's been remarkable to watch the dramatic change of this landscape. It's, it's no longer possible to ignore. But before we go too far into the future, we have to go back to the beginning. Glaciers form in mountainous hollows where snow piles up over many years. With time, that snow compresses, forming ice, but it doesn't become a glacier until it very slowly starts to flow downhill. The water from our glaciers in the Rocky Mountains helps to feed our rivers that flow across the prairies, rivers like the North Saskatchewan, the Athabasca, or the Bow River. A glacier's life cycle depends on snowfall accumulating and melting away throughout the year, but when more melts than can be replaced, the glacier will begin to shrink. And we're seeing that shrinking already. A trip to the toe of the Athabasca Glacier in the 1920s would have ended near the present day highway, but now it's well over a kilometer back. Glaciers in Western Canada are being hit pretty hard by changes in climate. So some studies done recently show that, for example, in Western Canada, BC and, and Alberta, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of ice volume will be lost by 2100. And nowhere is that loss more obvious than here, the outwash plain. 15 years ago, where we're sitting now was ice. So even accessing the toe of the glacier now is a completely different game. And it's no longer changing over like five or six or seven years. 
it's quite literally the, in the summer changing over five or six or seven days. And that change is perhaps the most evident when it comes to our waterways. Glaciers contribute the most water to our landscape when everything else is drying up. Think late August when there's no snow melt and little rain. The higher water levels are really important for fish species. So uh, fish that spawn in the fall really need those higher water levels in the fall. And without glaciers, um, the water levels would be much lower. And that would be really problematic for a lot of fish species. During particularly hot summers, you could even see glacially fed rivers go up in volume as melt increases. We're entering the time where the glaciers are still voluminous enough to contribute a lot of water but they haven't retreated far enough back that that contribution is reducing. And so we might have a 20 year window of this much water after which it's gonna to start to fall off a cliff. And when the glaciers are gone, so too is that water. We can look a little bit south and see what happens in Montana and Idaho already as they've essentially lost their glaciers and uh, things get very, very dry when they uh, get into a, a drought period. Scientists say we're past the tipping point for many of Canada's Rocky Mountain glaciers. The calculations that many scientists have done suggest that even if somehow magically we're able to stop global warming tomorrow and return the atmosphere to uh, more normal CO2 concentrations, uh, we would lose most of the Rockies glaciers. And while the Columbia ice field may survive until 2100, glaciers like the Pado Glacier near Banff could be gone by 2030. And the Icefields Parkway, named for its glacier of vistas, could become a relic within a couple of decades. When you hear about a big weather event taking over the country, you probably think about something like the day after tomorrow. A planet overrun by floods, fire and ice, and only Dennis Quaid can save us from the storm. But the truth is, large-scale weather phenomena are a little more common than you may think. It may be the cold snap that holds multiple provinces in its grip for weeks, or the heat wave that sells out air conditioners in your city. When these large-scale events happen in Canada, the polar jet stream is usually involved. That's the narrow band of fast-moving air high up in the atmosphere that divides warm air in the south from colder polar air in the north. The jet stream circles the planet like a ribbon, moving from west to east with regular waves, but sometimes, say when the polar vortex or that cold, low-pressure system from the North Pole moves south, those waves can become more pronounced. What the weather's like in your area all depends on where that jet is in relation to you. So why do those cold snaps or even heat waves feel like they last forever? Big weather systems like high pressure can get in the jet stream's way, causing a sort of traffic jam in our atmosphere. This is what we would call a blocking pattern, and when that happens, conditions are basically pinned in place for days on end. So the question is, will we see more of these large-scale events as our climate changes? Scientists agree that we can expect to see more heat waves in the future, but when it comes to cold snaps, it's a little harder to predict. As the Arctic continues to warm at its faster rate, some experts say the jet stream could become unstable, which could lead to more of those big blocking events. So while we're still figuring out exactly how the jet stream will change in the future, we likely won't see any deep freezes chasing people down or tornadoes taking over Los Angeles. That being said, more extreme storms, stronger hurricanes and longer fire seasons, those are all things we will definitely need to be prepared for. Welcome back. Canada's boreal forest covers over 300 million acres. It's a staple on the Canadian landscape, stretching from Yukon all the way east towards Newfoundland. As we continue to see climate change, this vast forest is changing too. Canada is home to the world's largest relatively untouched forest. The boreal zone is home to Earth's coldest forest and stretches across Canada and around the globe covering 1.9 billion hectares globally. And the boreal forest is important. It not only serves as a huge carbon store, but a thriving ecosystems for plants and animals, including over 100 species of birds, mammals like moose and caribou, and 3.7 million people. Between wildfire, weather and other factors, the boreal forest is constantly changing, but climate change is bringing a new level of transformation. 
if we think about drought, if we think about fire, if we think about insects, disease, this large tract of forest is contending with all of these environmental threats all the time. But under climate change, at least some of these threats are more severe. So what can we expect in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba? Well, it largely depends on water. As our climate changes, we can expect milder winters and hotter summers. And the rain we get in the summer may not be enough to compensate for the water loss to evaporation and transpiration. That means a higher risk of drought and wildfire. And those drier conditions have a big impact on the boreal forest. When trees are faced with a lack of water, that's pretty serious, right? Um, those trees are adapted to holding out. They close their um, pores on their leaves to try to prevent water from escaping. But if they do that, they're not gaining sugars from photosynthesis. So they're not gaining the resources they need to grow. And so if we have year over year over year of drought, they're not gaining the resources they need to thrive. Experts say that water stress could make boreal forests across southern Alberta and Saskatchewan more vulnerable to pathogens, wildfire, and even pests. With more extensive wildfires and more severe outbreaks from insects like mountain pine beetles, the forests could lose their ability to regenerate. So what does that mean for our forests' future? There's kind of been emerging evidence that as the climate continues to warm, that the boreal biome might shift northward. And so this would include an expansion of boreal trees and shrubs into Arctic and Alpine tundra in the coldest margins of the boreal forest, as well as potentially a contraction of the forest along the southern margins. With growth to the north and recession to the south, the future health and size of the boreal forest system will come down to a matter of balance and timing. It's just a lot of dynamic change and it's going to take a while for things to kind of settle into any kind of equilibrium. So if you lose an older forest um, here in the south, you don't really have the opportunity to, to make that up really very soon. So that means a lot of species that are depending on older mature forest, especially coniferous uh, forest in particular, there's just less of that um, habitat going to be available in the short term. So with all of this being said, is it too late to save our boreal forests? While some of the changes we're seeing may be inevitable at this point, we can still have an impact. Of course, lowering greenhouse gas emissions is key, but we can also work to protect our boreal forests, especially those that have the best chances of lasting, those with plenty of local water sources and more sheltered topography. Was it ever too late to do something better? I would say no, I'm a little bit of an optimist that way we can always try to do a little bit better and hope that that's going to have an effect, but we can never wind back the clock. From Australia to California to Canada, the last few years have been marked by intense wildfire, and lots of it. And while wildfires are a natural part of our ecosystem, climate change is speeding things up, and that could outstrip our forest's ability to regenerate themselves. Fire experts say Canada has about 6,000 fires each year, burning around 2.5 million hectares. That's doubled what we saw early in the 1970s. So how is climate change speeding things up? Well, scientists have identified three major ways. One is our longer summers. Wildfire season now start about a month earlier than when they used to. Number two, more lightning. Now while we're getting better about human-caused fires, we can't control the skies. And with warmer, unsettled summer weather, we can expect more storms, more lightning, and that means more chances for fires to start. The third factor is probably the most important when it comes to wildfire spread, drier fire fuels. Our increasingly hot and dry summers are really good at sucking moisture out of our vegetation, making them the perfect kindling. So what does this all mean for us? Scientists say we only have to look a little further south to see what Canada's future could look like. In the western United States, where wildfire burn areas are four times the size they were 50 years ago. Now, the good news is that our ability to manage these extreme fire scenarios is always improving. Thinning vegetation and doing prescribed burns helps keep wildfires under control, while still leaving room for the natural wildfire cycles our forests need to stay healthy. You've probably heard the world is getting hotter. According to Environment and Climate Change Canada, Alberta and Saskatchewan have warmed by 1.9 degrees since the mid 20th century, and that's faster than the global rate. So how will climate change affect life on the prairies? 
One thing we're already seeing is shorter, warmer winters and hotter summers with more heat waves. As we continue to warm, we can expect that to continue. Also, because warmer air can hold more moisture, that means bigger storms with more rain, which increases the risk of flooding. But most of that extra precipitation won't happen when we need it. And with our warming winters, expect less snow and more rain. Most of the water in our lakes and rivers and our, our groundwater, it's from melting snow. So melting snow is a very efficient way of delivering our water because the snow that falls throughout the winter gets stored as snow and melts in the spring. And as opposed to the rain in summer, which isn't nearly as effective because it, it tends to evaporate. With more of that evaporation, scientists are predicting more droughts in the future, especially across the southern prairies. All that hot and dry weather could also lead to longer and more severe fire seasons. Over time, those changes in precipitation and temperature will change what our landscape looks like and what lives here. Boreal forests could transition to aspen parkland and grassland. Island forest oases in Saskatchewan like Cypress Hills or Moose Mountain could also mostly disappear. And all of those changes will affect animals too. It's really the generalists that are sticking around, the ones that are able to adapt, whereas the species that need more narrow environmental conditions and niches, there's, they're the ones that are losing. While some animals and insects will disappear, others will take their place. We've seen trends in different species. For example, grassland species and aerial insectivores have declined by 60% across the prairies. Um, we've seen an increase in wetland birds um, up to 30% increase. We could also see more invasive species, or even species more common further south moving north. Think about winter ticks in Saskatchewan or white-tailed deer in Alberta that can now live here because of our warmer winters. So our climate is changing and with that we will see changes to our landscape, but just how much will depend on the degree of warming. If you'd like to learn more about how climate change is affecting the prairies, visit our website cbc.ca slash sask. Thank you for watching this special presentation of CBC Saskatchewan News. I'm Christy Kleimenhaga. Thanks for spending your time with us.